<clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Randy here again with you. Um, today is July 26th. It's hard to believe this is the last Sunday of, of July. Um, uh, summer is flying by. Um, I love the summer, but it's probably not my favorite season just because it gets so hot, and I know it's hot right now. Um, this is a recorded um, Sunday School lesson, so you'll have a chance to um, stop this anytime you want to and um, uh, think about the lesson, um, kind of take it in small uh, bits and pieces if you'd like. In fact, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, today we're going to be um, in the last lesson of this unit, um, and the title of the lesson is Forgiving, Merciful, and Compassionate. It is the focal passage is going to be centered on um, the ninth chapter of Isaiah, uh, not Isaiah, Nehemiah, excuse me. And so I'm going to give you a chance to uh, get your Bible out, put your finger right there in that ninth chapter of Nehemiah, because um, I'm going to try to introduce um, this um, passage of Scripture kind of where it is historically, I think it kind of helps if you know kind of where it lays and uh, what's going on there. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background of, of Nehemiah and kind of where it falls into Israel's history and kind of what's going on. And uh, you'll recognize it uh, very quickly where it is, but it seems like Israel history repeats itself um, so often that, you know, they go into um, uh, coming into a land and then um, being, um, um, overrun by another nation and then exiled back to that country and then back to Israel and back to the, another country. So it's just kind of where it lays. So I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a background of Nehemiah. Then I want you to kind of read that chapter. Just take your time and read the chapter. I think it's maybe 30, 38 verses or so. Uh, but it's really quite interesting. It's more interesting to me uh, when you get the historical background and what, why that is being written and who it's been written by. Um, so uh, if you will, go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles, open it up to uh, uh, Nehemiah, the, the ninth chapter, and then we'll give a little bit of a history of what's going on. Okay, let's begin. Um, and just a, just a little bit of a, a history and a kind of a terminology so we kind of can um, figure out where we are in the Old Testament. Um, the people have been, of Judah have been exiled to Babylon. And those, um, uh, that part of Israel, the southern part, which is called Judah, uh, they're referred to as Judahites. So if you ever come up, uh, come over, uh, come up with the term Judahites, those are the ones who were exiled to uh, Babylon. And the Judahites became shortened to the word Jews. And so that's kind of where we get that. But Judah was one of the two Hebrew kingdoms um, uh, populated by the, the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, and those two together are also called Israel. Uh, so the people of Judah can also be referred to the Israelites. So I know it gets a kind of confusing there, but as well. So if you ever hear, hear those terms, Judahites, Jews, um, Israelites, um, that's who we're talking about there. And by the time that Judah fell to the Babylonians, um, the other Hebrew kingdom, Israel, had already fallen to the Assyrian kingdom. And its population had been scattered. Um, so people everywhere um, kind of hung on the uh, identity of being an Israelite. Um, so, again, when you hear the word Judite or a, a Judahite or a Jew or an Israelite, or sometimes in the Bible they're called returnees uh, because they... Uh, return from exile to their homeland. And so they're also uh, re referred to as returnees. And so um, last week we talked a little about, uh, not last week, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, Daniel and his um, fellow Israelites. They served the Babylonian empire for years. And uh, Daniel served until uh, the reign of Cyrus, who was the Persian king who, um, who led the conquest of the, uh, the conquest of the Babylonian. And so King Cyrus um, dealt with uh, captive, pe uh, captive people differently than the Babylonians had. And so Cyrus had a proclamation uh, allowing the Jews to return to Judah, uh, which was now part of the Persian Empire. 
And so the books of Ezra and Nehemiah um, tell us of the returning exiles and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and, and the temple. Um, and, and that rebuilding did not happen quickly, nor did it happen uh, very easily. Um, the Israelites had spent so much time in a foreign land that they had forgotten how to uh, celebrate the great festivals um, that, that relied on them gathering at the temple to make sacrifices. And the people had become uh, uh, unused to living as a covenant people in their own land. And so several generations have passed. And so those younger generations have not had that firsthand experience of, of what it was like. So Ezra, you've heard that name before, Ezra was um, a priest and a scribe who was, who was a religious uh, uh, leader of the returnees. And he had resolved to study the Holy Scriptures and to teach them to the people. Uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to Ataxerxes, one of the later, later kings of uh, Persia. And though, although a cupbearer just meant that he had a high position in, that, um, in Babylon, um, but his heart too mourned for the people of Judah. And so Nehemiah shares his concern with his human lord, um, um, Ataxerxes, I think is how you said that king's name, a Persian king. Um, and so he, uh, Nehemiah re gained permission to uh, return to Jerusalem to do what he could do to rebuild Jerusalem and, and the walls, the, the walls of Jerusalem and, and the temple. And so he thought that the very first order of business was to um, uh, rebuild the walls of the city. And so Nehemiah uh, organizes that uh, effort and he gave each family um, uh, their part to do. But he still had a lot of opposition from the people who had occupied um, Israel when they left in uh, exile. So he had a lot of uh, continued opposition, but Nehemiah's uh, efforts and his, uh, all those that worked with him, his efforts were, um, had succeeded. And so once the wall was built, um, the people had all come uh, together in the seventh month and they asked Ezra uh, to read from the Torah of Moses. And so Nehemiah 8, the one right before our chapter, records um, this event. And if you, if you go, if you have a chance to read that, it's a really amazing uh, a narrative uh, relaying that the people were so hungry to hear uh, the word of God that they literally listened for hours upon hours to the Torah as it was read to them. And the Levites, uh, that, um, that clan of the human one of the one of the tribes, um, they were the um, usually all the priests came from that line, and so they went among uh, the people to help them to explain um, what they were hearing. And the people were, were very emotional in in their response to what they were hearing. And when they discovered uh, that the seventh month was the time for celebrating the festival of booths. Um, or Festival of Tabernacles, uh, they made a provision to go ahead and celebrate that long forgotten uh, festival. And so the passage for this lesson takes place a few weeks after uh, that celebration of the Festival of Booths. Um, and unlike the joyful feasting of the previous gathering, this time the people came together to mourn um, their sins and to once again hear the their a sacred reading of, of the scriptures. And the people as a whole um, confessed their sins. And this time the Levites reminded them first of God's great blessings and then of the troubled relationship that God had, that Israel had with, with their God, a rebelling time, and but again, um, continually, see, continually receiving God's um, mercy and, and forgiveness. And so um, the full passage is a prayer on behalf of all the people. So if you have a chance, go ahead and pause this recording for, for 
however long it takes you to read um, Nehemiah, the ninth chapter. I would probably get somewhere in the house where you can read it out loud, where you don't bother anybody or where you don't feel like you're um, uh, inhibited by reading it. But reading it aloud sometimes helps me to understand it uh, and to concentrate on the words and what they're saying. But it, it does not take too long. It's only 38 verses. Um, so take, just take a moment to, uh, to pause this and to read that uh, chapter um, for whoever is, is with you, whoever wants to sit there and, and stand there and listen to you. But we'll get back on the other side of uh, Nehemiah, the ninth chapter. Hey everybody, did you enjoy that? It's kind of interesting to me uh, to read Old Testament when I know kind of where it lands in history and, and what, was, uh, what was happening. Um, the book of Nehemiah actually was was probably written, um, see if I can get a timeline, an actual timeline uh, for you. Um, it was probably written somewhere in um, 445 to uh, 432 BC. So it's, you know, it's, it's well 400 years before uh, the, uh, the birth of Christ. So you can kind of see where it falls in, in history. I was thinking as I was reading over this lesson, and uh, have you ever um, gone back to a place, especially maybe a place in your childhood, maybe a place that you lived or um, went to school and just driven by just to be kind of reminded of that place, how different it seems to be? Um, I remembered as a kid when I lived up in northern Indiana, we lived on a house on the river and uh, uh, right next to the Tippecanoe River. And I remember as a kid, I just thought that house was so big and the yard was so big. And um, uh, I just thought it was, you know, it was a, it was a great place. I loved that place. And, uh, but I had a, a just a, as a kid, you, you think of things differently. When I came back years ago, when I brought Lucinda and the boys uh, to see it, I think we saw it actually for the first time. Uh, and, and I realized how, small of a house it was. The yard was about, oh, I think a little over an acre. Uh, but at the time, you know, it was huge to us. We played baseball games in it. It was apple trees in the yard. We climbed and mulberry trees. We climbed those trees. And, um, it just seemed so big when I came back uh, after being grown up and being a parent, it just seemed, man, it was so small. Um, same thing happened as you go to your old school, maybe your elementary school, you walk in, you have a chance to walk in and uh, you see how, how small it was and how things different look different once you've been away for a time you ever thought about that if you've if, if you've ever gone back to a high school reunion how different people look than what you remember um, it's been a while since i've been to a high school reunion and i see most of my old classmates on facebook and so you don't sometimes you get to see pictures of them and you go i, I just don't remember and i kind of wonder do i look so different to them like they do to me because it looks so different so if you've ever had that experience, um, what was it, what was most difficult about um, returning? Uh, and, and the reason I want you to think about that is um, because as the Israelites were coming back after, at, uh, after their exile, you know, they had been se several generations. And so a lot of them had only heard uh, what it was like in the promised land um, through stories. You know, a lot of them, uh, most of them probably didn't have firsthand experiences. They were, um, it, they were trying to put, uh, put everything together in terms of what maybe their parents or their grandparents had remembered, what it was like. So what do you think it was like for the Israelites as they came back after uh, several decades away? Um, like I said, they, 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 they might not have lived up to their expectations. Uh, uh, especially when they got back there and said uh, and saw the devastation because you know the Jerusalem specifically and the uh, temple had not been rebuilt it was still in a state of destruction you know kind of a rubble and so you know, maybe they were uh, expecting to see this magnificent temple in this uh, in this walled city uh, magnificent but it wasn't it was just really a, a rubble So just kind of think about that for just a second and kind of think if, if you can have any first uh, hand experiences of uh, going back to a place that you remembered and it wasn't quite the same as what you remembered. 
as you've uh, had a chance to read through um, the passage for today, um, I just want to point out a couple things and maybe ask you some questions that you can um, um, consider uh, this week uh, in some thought and some meditation about. The first thing I want to point out maybe is that this prayer um, um, recorded uh, by Nehemiah really spends uh, um, uh, more time on God's, uh, his mighty act of salvation and his mercy uh, rather than on anger and unpunishing acts. Um, but, you know, and many people kind of have the idea that the Old Testament, that, that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, and to, in contrast to the loving God as portrayed in the New Testament. But the purpose of today's lesson is to remember how God saved people even when they turned away. And wasn't this the M.O. Of, of the people from Israel, uh, both the northern and the southern kingdom, was to um, get close to God and, and, and then have a falling away after a while. And God would punish them uh, by either being exiled to another country and then God would bring them back out of uh, exile into their own promised land. And they would, again, renew their uh, commitment to um, to make Jehovah their only God. And so today I just want to kind of have a, maybe a discussion on um, uh, the relationship between God's judgment and on God's mercy. And so here's the first question I want you to think about. And uh, again, just pause this as I ask the question. If we were together live, we would probably have uh, several good responses to these. But since... Um, we are not live. I just have to trust that maybe you actually think about these questions and, and talk about them with whoever's with you at, at, at the moment. First question is this. When are the times that we depend on God's justice? You know, it, it could be justice with our enemies that we feel that, that uh, they've done us wrong or, uh, uh, that they deserve uh, justice. Maybe those who trespass against us, we say that prayer quite often when we're together in the Lord's Prayer. So when are the times that we depend on God's justice? Uh, this last Sunday, uh, we heard the stories that Dave, Les, and Lucinda uh, read for us about those persecuted Christians and um, how do we hope that justice prevails for them in terms of um, being able to being able to have a place to live uh, without being threatened with their life or maybe um, get a chance to have their children back living with them and, um, and not being arrested and held for bail because we've, you know, they've been meeting together as a Christian families. So think about that question. Are there times in your life when you depend on God's, um, God's justice? And then as you um, think about that question, have time to ponder it, ponder on this question. When are, uh, when are the times we depend on God's mercy? Um, and obvious, the obvious response in my mind is we, when we are in need of God's mercy, uh, when we have been the ones who sin against um, God and uh, our neighbor. Um, you know, so I, uh, uh, in my life, I probably um, get the justice I deserve, but sometimes I, I probably need more mercy because I am uh, certainly not perfect, and I have to have to ask God for His mercy um, uh, probably quite often, probably more than I need to have to ask for God's mercy, but I certainly need it. And the last question to ponder as as you think about uh, today's lesson, the scripture that we've just read. What are, when and what are the uh, times and places that you can see that God has been at work in your life uh, or in the life of your community, uh, commu uh, your, your faith community? Um, and, and would you, do you remember them as acts of, of justice or a judgment or mercy? Um, I just kind of want to get um, you to think about that and, and, and talk about 
that with whoever you're with or maybe even by yourself. Just ask yourself that question. You know, the prayer that uh, is offered in Nehemiah 9, um, the people confess their sins um, several times. And uh, when we are together um, for communion, a lot of times when we go through the liturgy of communion, part of that liturgy uh, is that we have a, um, um, a communal um, confession uh, where we confess our sins um, corporately. And, um, and I want to maybe spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, I've never really understood, I, I've, I guess I've had trouble in the past with, um, with a corporate uh, prayer, um, especially if it's a corporate prayer, um, asking for forgiveness of sins uh, in our individual past or uh, in, in a people's past. Um, I guess I've had uh, trouble with that, but in, in thinking through this lesson, um, I think I may understand it a little bit more, uh, the need for a corporal um, prayer of confession and why that might be good for us to do that um, as a spiritual discipline. Because whether or not we have committed um, those individual sins that are mentioned in, in our corporate confession, um, we share in uh, one another's sin and in the sinful nature of, of the community of faith. And that's something that we all do. And that's something obviously that we'll never get past because we have a sinful nature. And so um, the corporate prayer, so to speak, is, uh, or the corporate prayer of confession is how we hold one another accountable. And I think that is a, uh, uh, a mandate that we have as uh, spiritual brothers and sisters, as a family, as uh, the family of God is to hold each other accountable. And that's one, we can, one way we can do that is we can confess our sins corporately, uh, whether they're sins of omission or commission, uh, ones that we do and ones that we sin by not doing. And so if you, if you, if you have a hymn book and you want to look through, especially our uh, uh, order of communion, you can read through that corporate prayer and you can maybe com compare that to the one that the people prayed in Nehemiah. I think that was a very good uh, comparison. So I know it's a it, it might this might be a shorter lesson than normal, but maybe you have had time to uh, pause and reflect upon those questions. Um, there's no need for me to sit here and lecture to you because I know that um, uh, you can think through these things uh, probably well without my help. But uh, maybe these are just some few guidelines. Uh, last week um, I wanted you to compare uh, Psalm 37 with Psalm 73. Um, and so I hope you've had time to do that this week and uh, look those over. This week, I'm going to go ahead and give you several more psalms to look through before we get together um, next week. Uh, next week, we'll be starting a, a new unit. And so um, I'll introduce that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, if you have a pen and paper, uh, a, a pencil or a, a pen and a piece of paper, uh, here's uh, the psalms that I want you to read through each day this week. Um, on Monday, um, take a look at Psalm 105, um, and we're actually going to do uh, 105, 106, and 107 on Monday, Tuesday, and uh, excuse me, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So Monday it's going to be Psalm 105, and and we're really remembering God's mighty acts of uh, salvation. And then um, Tuesday, when you look over Psalm 106, uh, remember not only God's mighty acts of salvation. Uh, but our sinfulness uh, as well is thrown into the mix. And then basically 107 kind of keeps us, uh, uh, helps us to remember maybe the same, the same theme as, as on Tuesday, Psalm 106. 107 is remembering God's mighty act of salvation. And again, our sinfulness. And it, it, it helps us to, re to remind that we are a sinful people, that we have a sinful nature, and that maybe every day we have to rely upon uh, um, God help us through that. And then on Thursday, uh, go back to Psalm 51. It's a psalm of confession and a desire for a clean heart. And uh, you can almost hear uh, David as he works through that, desiring for a clean heart. 
he's still battling within himself that sometimes he, 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 he goes back and forth between the desire and um, the need for forgiveness because he has not fulfilled the desire to have a clean heart. So um, Psalm 51 is Thursday's uh, uh, Psalm that you need to go through. Then Friday, a look at Psalm 130. Um, Psalm 30 really is a desperate um, cry for forgiveness. And, and then also uh, remembering that, that God does hear that uh, cry and that God hears us when we, when we cry to him, when we speak to him. And then um, as we approach Saturday, look at Psalm 32. It's, it's, a, it's Thanksgiving for forget, uh, forgiveness. How wonderful that we do experience forgiveness um, and that it is not something that, that, we, that we earn, um, but it's just a, it's, it's given by grace. And, and so as you read that, um, uh, culminate in Sunday when you read Psalm 150, which is really just joyful praise to God. And that might give you a, a chance to prepare yourself for uh, the sermon. Uh, I think the sermon this week uh, that uh, Carlos is going to be looking at is, uh, I'm not sure which one, if it's uh, uh, Jeremiah or what it's going to be. I forgot where we're at this week. I think it's the, the sermon is just on Jeremiah. It's another of the Unraveled series. So anyway, uh, thank you for joining me here. Um, uh, hopefully when you see this, we'll be uh, in uh, northern Michigan and probably hopefully enjoying some cooler summer weather. Uh, summers in northern Michigan are uh, very, very different than in middle Tennessee. Um, still warm, but uh, not usually quite so hot. And if it's hot, it's very dry uh, or it's much drier than, than here. So enjoy. Thank you for um, joining me here this week. And um, we'll see you again next week. Talk to you soon. Have a safe day. Bye-bye.